The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, grant us by that same Spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in its consolation. Through Christ our Lord, Amen. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm Thomas Nagley. I'm here with Father William Jenkins. He's a traditional Catholic priest. He is the superior of the Society of St. Pius V and he also serves as the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Very fine, Tom. Thank you. And yourself? Not too bad. It's good to see you. You too. As always. Uh, Father, as usual, any prayer requests you'd like to bring to yes, us? Yes, yes, uh, as, as always, Tom. Uh, and I did you ask prayers for Paul Riley and his dear family, and uh, also for Bonnie Montini. Bonnie was just diagnosed with cancer, and they're determining what uh, treatment to give her, so please pray for her. And I pray for the Chitty family as well. Pray for Mary and Shawhan. And uh, keeping your prayers, Ned Nelson, who just passed away in the town of Memphis, town, I should say, the city of Memphis. Uh, uh, as your family all gathered around him and uh, supporting him in every way they could. So uh, pray for his dear soul, for his wife, Lynn, who survives him, and so many other of uh, his loved ones also who miss him very much. Please pray for Cliff Hogan, for Cheryl Johnson and Ray Sasicki, and for Ginny Waters. Ginny's undergoing some very serious surgery uh, this coming uh, Friday, I believe it is, very delicate surgery, and um, we pray that uh, she be strong and the doctors be wise in their decisions and do the very best they can, but commend her to God's care because uh, their, her life is literally in their, in their hands. So uh, please also pray for Patrick Kunkel. I understand he's uh, suffering a uh, very, very serious liver, liver condition. Uh, which is always, of course, very dangerous. Pray for the J6 prisoners who are being held captive in federal prisons. Uh, pray for our United States of America. We've got to pray for our country that God may, um, uh, you know, grant her the graces of justification, repentance for sins, and reform. And uh, we want God to bless our country because we want our country to glorify God. So we pray for that. And of course, the church militant here on earth. We need to keep the church militant in our prayers, all these souls who are uh, at risk. Uh, we want uh, the fires of hell not to claim them. We want the glories of heaven to claim them. And so we ask the, uh, our Lord to have mercy on his suffering church in purgatory, as we pray for those in purgatory. But we also pray for the church on earth that God may deliver it from all dangers and um, uh, to um, reconfirm the church in, in the true faith. Okay. <clears throat> all right, we can do that. Um, something else you wanted to mention, Father, before we get... And, and protect the church against modernists, her modernist enemies, okay. <laughs> certainly. Yeah. Um, before we get to our questions, Father, we did want to mention uh, our... Um, Immaculate Conception online auction that we have going yes, on. Yes, we do have a fundraiser going yeah, on. Yeah, so. wonderful uh, fundraiser if any of our mm. viewers are interested in supporting that. I know there's all kinds of great um, items uh, for our auction. Um, the mm. link, I believe, we'll, we can post that uh, on our website. It might be available on the screen now. <clears throat> but um, there's all kinds of great great items to bid <clears throat> on in this online auction. It's a great way, easy way to support the Academy uh, sure. here, at, here at Immaculate Conception. So people can actually go online, look at the item auction items for auction right even now they can and if they see something they're interested in they can actually make a bid on mm -hmm. it right online okay. yeah. well it all helps it does so. yeah 
It's been a tremendous offer. Appreciate it if people would do that. Yes. They might find some very nice. I'm sure they'll find some really nice items there. There is, yeah. Um, okay. <clears throat> well, Father, we have. And how would they do that? Uh, we have. I think we have the link on our screen, but also we can post that on our website as well. So. Let's can... say so. The link on the screen mm -hmm. and on the website, yeah. they can follow that and go straight to the. The auction. Uh, well. The the auction itself. Okay, yes, that's great. How long will that continue then? Uh, I believe for another month or so. Is that right? I okay. think so, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But I'll I know the uh, the actual golf tournament is this coming Sunday, right? September 22nd. That's right. Well, that's the auction fast. will continue beyond that, though. Okay. Don't quote me on that, Father. I could be wrong, but it's a great, great uh, reason to check the link and <coughs> see all the information there. Yes. So don't wait for a month. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Do it now, please. Thank you. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Okay, well, Father, uh, lots of different topics tonight. Um, thought, though, maybe we could start with a great spiritual question we got from one of our viewers uh, who she wrote in and asked how one can live out the uh, St. Louis de Montfort's consecration to Jesus through Mary on a daily basis. And uh, she asked, what are some practical things that uh, someone could be doing each day mm -hmm. to live out this consecration? Well, uh, the book True Devotion to Mary is a very beautiful book by... Uh, Saint uh, Louis de Montfort. Louis Montfort, Louis Grillon de Montfort. He wrote beautifully about our Blessed Lady, and I'm sure there's a lot of very good advice in that book. As one prepares for that consecration, they can get a lot of good ideas. They meditate on it, and they'll be inspired to live out that consecration day by day. Of course, the Church tells us that uh, we are to consecrate ourselves to Our Lady. Uh, as Catholics, just by the very fact that we are born of the Church, of the baptismal font, uh, we become children of Mary, and we should be devoted to Our Lady by praying the daily rosary, by wearing the scapular, at least the, the brown scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Uh, those are things that we should do every single day. Okay? We make the morning offering uh, each day, and... Um, we offer these things to our Lord, the, the various vicissitudes of the day, our prayers, works, joys, and sufferings. We offer to our Lord at the beginning. And it's a good idea to offer them through the hands of Mary. Uh, if we offer these things to our Lord, uh, that's very pleasing to our Lord, but if we offer them specifically through the hands of Our Lady and ask her to accompany us to our Lord and present them on our behalf, um, they, they have a special mark on them. Uh, Our Lady <clears throat> gives everything an, an aura of special holiness and love. So we can make that act of um, the morning offering <clears throat> through Our Lady's Immaculate Heart to Our Lord's Sacred Heart. And that's something we can do each day of our lives. Uh, we begin the day uh, by uh, therefore offering uh, through Our Lady. And we should remember that periodically during the day. You know, praying the memorari periodically during the day, um, even as a novena. Um, a, a series of nine of anything can be considered a novena. <clears throat> Certainly, uh, offering a novena of memoraries each day, um, every hour in the hour, uh, whatever, for nine, for nine hours, we can offer that for some very special intention, right? And... Um, we can also um, pray the little office of our Blessed Lady. The little office of our Blessed Mother is accessible to everyone. And um, it doesn't take that long, actually. But it's, it's a daily remembrance of Our Lady and an act of thanksgiving to God for providing this great gift of Our Lady. It's kind of an answer we, we give to our Lord on the cross uh, giving Our Lady to St. John and through St. John to all of us, all who would be faithful disciples of our Lord. And so we can honor Our Lady by praying that divine office of our Blessed Mother. Um, it's also a very good idea to get into the habit of um, doing something during the day, each and every day, that we're doing specifically um, for the love of Our Lady. Um, it's something we should remember as we're, for example, driving down the road and somebody is driving irresponsible, irresponsibly 
somebody might even, um, we, we feel, uh, slight us or insult us or however, by the way they're driving. Or, you know, even the supermarket, wherever we go these days, there are contradictions. And if we just make it a point that, well, I'm not going to let this day pass without offering at least one act of patience in honor of our Blessed Lady and her acts of patience. Because, you know, you're studying the life of Our Lady, you find that virtually everything she done was, did was an act of obedience, an act of patience, an act of love, all of them together, continually rising from her immaculate heart to, our, to God in heaven. And so um, if we will unite those three things as an act of obedience to God accepting what he sends and an act of humility and an act of uh, patience and love, if we combine all of those and uh, be sure that every day we're going to do something unique. Uh, and, you know, if we make that offering to God, he will point out to us as we go through the day. God himself will point out to us what it is he's asking us to do. And uh, he can easily point that out to us through the agency of our guardian angel. So that you might be going, if you make that act, uh, of that intentional act of offering something in union with the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and her humility and her patience and her obedience and her love, and uh, then you can be sure that God is going to remind you, is going to point out to you each day, okay, this is what I want from you. Maybe somebody cuts you off in line at the, at the supermarket. Maybe somebody cuts you off in traffic, right? Who knows what? Uh, maybe you drop something even, you know, you have to go bend down and pick it up. Maybe you dropped it and it rolled under the chair, you know. Things like that we find very aggravating. Um, but don't be surprised if you, if you do tell our Lord that, Lord, in honor of Mary and in thanksgiving for your giving Mary to me as my mother, your mother as my mother here on earth, um, I want to offer something specifically for her and in thanksgiving to you for giving her to me. And so each day I will offer some act of patience. Um, and my memory of this will enable me to be patient at that time when ordinarily I might tend to lose my temper. And I know that from past experience. My tendencies there are, are real, and they're there, and they're instant to, to flare up and lose my temper. But we're going to find then, if we make that offering, that our guardian angels are going to kind of catch that. And when something happens like that, it's going to be right there. That thought is going to be right there. Offer this. Offer this to me. And this is our Lord and Our Lady's way of saying, well, okay, you made the offering. Well, this is what I want for you this day. I want this act of patience about this matter right now on this day. And uh, that's a great reminder. We need those reminders. So uh, there are a lot of ways to honor Our Lady during the day. Of course, I mean, people have a little statue of Our Blessed Mother in their rooms, light the candles, write a blessed candle in front of the statue, have their devotions there during the day. There's so many, many, many ways they can outwardly honor Our Lady, but it's the interior honoring of Our Lady by practicing her virtues that pleases her so much because that is what gives glory to her son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And she wants us to uh, live as she did. Um, what does the gospel say? She pondered in her heart the events of our Lord's life. So she meditated on these things. Our Lady wants us to do the same thing. <clears throat> and she was constantly yielding well, she didn't even have to yield because she was God's handmaiden. So um, when I say she was constantly yielding, it's so she made a decision. Well, it's my will or God's will. I'm going to give it to God's will. It wasn't that way with Our Lady because she was so selfless and so humble. It was all about God's will all the time. right? So uh, she didn't have to force herself to give way to God's will. right? Um, and when we... Even if we have to make that choice and force ourselves to make the choice, choosing between our will and God's will, but we make the, the choice of God's will to be patient, be generous, to be kind, be thoughtful, and so on, um, for God's sake, this gives glory to our Lord, it pleases our lady very much, and she's going to assist us in every way to do that.
every day of our lives. <clears throat> All right. That's great. Thank you, Father. Um, Father, why is the Blessed Sacrament called the Bread of Angels? Well, bread is what nourishes you, right? And um, our Lord himself told his apostles once when they said that they had brought food, uh, that he has a bread of which they can't even see. They're not aware. And uh, our Lord is talking about the spiritual bread nourishing the soul. Our Lord had a human soul, as you know, and his human soul was nourished by divine things, divine grace. And so when our Lord would go off into the mountains to pray at night, he was nourishing this human soul of his. And uh, so it was with, you know, the, the contemplation of the divinity, which he had and glorified uh, in his glorified soul, he had uh, that uh, nourishment from God himself. That is what we <clears throat> refer to um, that spiritual nourishment of our soul, our souls being our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. It is through that that um, the bread of earth is taken away. Transubstantiation takes place, and there the bread of heaven comes to us um, instead of the bread of earth, you might say, right? Uh, that the bread of heaven gives way, the bread of earth gives way to the bread of heaven. Remember what our Lord said after he had fed the thousands out of the wilderness. And then they wanted to make him king, and he disappeared from them. The next day they found him in the synagogue at Capernaum. And our Lord says to them, You came seeking me because you ate of the bread that I gave you out in the wilderness. But your fathers, remember, ate the manna in the desert, and they've all died. They all perished. <coughs> but I have a bread. <coughs> if anyone eat of this bread, he will not see death forever. This is a living bread that has come down from heaven. And when they pressed him on it, our Lord said, I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. I am the living bread. And that's when he promised to give them his body and blood to eat and drink. They didn't make the connection between the manna, the living bread, the Eucharist as we know it, as Christ established it, all they knew is that Christ said he was the living bread, and if one would eat of this nourishment, it would, it would, it alone could give everlasting life. And uh, then he went on to say, you must eat of me, right, to have that, that life in you. And if you do, the Father and I will come and we will dwell within you. And of course, the Holy Ghost, too, would come and would dwell within you. So our Lord made that reference to himself being the living bread, and then saying, I'm going to come to you, that you can actually eat of me. Um, the significance of this for the Jews should have been that uh, our Lord was essentially telling them, I am going to be your sacrifice. I'm going to be sacrificed for you. And if you want to share in my sacrifice and have part in my sacrifice and benefit from my sacrifice and live from my sacrifice, you have to live from me. You have to eat of me. You have to eat of the sacrifice. And I will make it possible for you to do that by giving you, giving myself to you in a way that you can actually lovingly receive me. And that is what we know as, well, Holy Communion, that reception of our Lord, our Eucharistic Lord. So that is why Holy Communion, that is why the Holy Eucharist is called the bread of angels. Uh, the angels themselves in heaven feast upon the receiving spiritually the, uh, the Son of God, and now they see him also as the Son of God and the Son of Man, and they see him in, this, in his glory and his love and his perfection, and this to them is the sweetest bread, the, the, uh, the most delicious nourishment possible, right? And their, their, their souls are feasting on this, the sight of this, the glory of God right now. And that starts with us here on earth, being in the state of grace and being able to approach our Lord and his coming to us in Holy Communion. We are given the grace, we are given the, the grace here to receive even the bread 
that the angels are feasting on in heaven. We are given it in a very special way, though, in, um, by the act of consecration of the host and, the, and the, the wine on the altar, becoming the body and blood of Christ. We receive him body, blood, soul, and divinity all together as our Savior, living and true, glorified. Okay. Um, next question, Father, why do some translations of the Our Father read, give us this day our super substantial bread? Is that term, the super substantial, is that more accurate than daily bread? Well, there are two accounts of the prayer of the Our Father in the Gospels, okay? And um, <clears throat> one of them says, give us this day our daily bread. But the other reads, give us this day our super substantial bread. <coughs> that is how the Greek is translated. Uh, I'm trying to remember exactly the term that is used there. But it's a, it's a, very, it's a very accurate translation. Super substantial bread is the meaning of it. And so we actually have two renderings, you might say, even in the Greek Gospels of the prayer of the, um, the Our Father. <coughs> but they're not identical. And they, they give two different words modifying the bread. One is the daily bread, one is the super substantial bread. And the wonderful thing is they kind of complement each other. Because the super substantial bread is this bread of angels. The super substantial bread, which is like above the substance of bread, is an indication of that the, there's something supernatural about this. It's not just ordinary bread. It's some supernatural thing that we receive. What we, what we referred to a moment ago is the bread of angels. God feeds us. So... Um, that uh, rendering of the Our Father with the word super substantial has a very mystical, theological meaning to it. That it is not just bread. We're asking our Lord to give us himself. When we pray that, <clears throat> we're asking him, please, Lord, let me receive you in Holy Communion. Okay, give yourself to me. So you might say it's at least a spiritual, an act of spiritual communion when you put it that way. And you think about it, and you realize the significance of what you're saying. <clears throat> Give me the bread of heaven. Give me the bread of angels. Give me the living bread that has come down from heaven yourself. And uh, when we say then the daily bread, and again, it's an indication what our Lord wants us to, to think of each day of our lives, that this is, <clears throat> this is what our Lord wants to give us every single day. He wants to come to us and give us life every single day of our lives. Um, you know, we, we talk about fasting, and that's making a deliberate uh, decision not to eat for a certain amount of time. We consider fasting to be having one main meal during the day and two smaller meals. That's fasting for us. Some people go out of fast, like a black fast, for a day or two or three or four. Uh, eventually, you're going to give out, though. Uh, you'll, your strength will simply, uh, you know, evaporate away. And given a lot of time, your system sets down, you begin to die, obviously. You can't live without that nourishment. What our Lord wants to make it clear to us is that we cannot live for a moment without that nourishment for heaven. <clears throat> that we need every day of our lives that nourishment of God from heaven in terms <clears throat> of his grace in order to keep us faithful and loyal to him. In other words, to keep us spiritually alive to keep us spiritually going, to sustain us, to sustain the spiritual life. We need this D super substantial bread daily. Mm -hmm. Why does the, uh, the daily bread seem to be the, the prevailing translation? And why in the Mass um, do, we, do we use that one instead of the super substantial? <clears throat> That's a very good question. I don't know how it was chosen that way. Um, I would guess because... The word super substantial is a big word, and it probably is rather mystifying to people who do not have a theological background. And so I imagine through tradition, the church chose our daily bread as, as were because this is sort of the prayer, a more childlike prayer. And um, 
you know, if you, if you look up epiusion, I forget what, uh, what the word is in Greek. It's an unusual word, even in Greek. Super substantial. It's an unusual word in English, uh, as, as well as in Greek. And perhaps because the word is so unique, I don't know if it's used anywhere else in the New Testament. Um, I would doubt it. I have to look that up. But because it is such a unique word, it probably gave way to the practice of using our daily bread uh, to indicate for the true Christian, uh, the Catholic who believes in the real presence, that this is what I need today to live and, and please God. I need that union with Christ that comes from the living bread coming to me from heaven. So Yeah, okay. it's good. All right. Um, Father, we had uh, a couple of viewers actually um, write in and they wanted to know your thoughts, uh, what, what you thought about the idea that a valid Episcopal consecration would remedy any defects in a priestly ordination. Have you ever heard that before? <clears throat> so if someone was not validly ordained a priest, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, yeah. then he was, when he was uh, consecrated a bishop, that would confer the priesthood on him. Right. Uh, an order that he hadn't received. And then, well, there are those who have suggested this in the time of the history of the church, but the church has never ratified that idea and has never practiced that. I don't know that there's a single, and I, you know, I, I don't know of any, any case where uh, someone was simply per saltum raised uh, jumping over the priesthood to the episcopacy and being consecrated a bishop and thus, in a sense, including the priesthood in that consecration. Um, the church doesn't actually, and historically has not regarded the episcopacy as a separate order. She refers to the four minor orders and the three major orders culminating in the priesthood. Because the priesthood confers upon a man the power over the real body of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament, which is considered the ultimate power, really. Um, the episcopacy, of course, they call it the fullness of the priesthood, but uh, it uh, was not considered to be a separate order unto itself. <clears throat> and the church has really never, uh, never ruled on the subject that I know of, uh, that <laughs> ordaining someone or consecrating someone a bishop would make him a priest. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and in fact, in practice, I don't know that the church has ever allowed that ever sanctioned that anywhere. Um, you think of St. Ambrose, right? He um, was a, a public official sent to uh, Milan because of trouble there. The bishop had died. The bishop was a Catholic bishop. Uh, or, if, well, there was a strong Arian party anyway, a strong Arian heretic party there in Milan, and they wanted their bishop chosen, an Arian bishop. And the Catholics were resisting, of course, and uh, Ambrose arrived to keep the peace, and he spoke so beautifully, even as a layman, as a public official, he spoke so beautifully. He was only a catechumen at the time. He wasn't even baptized yet. But so profound was his faith and his hope and charity that everyone there was very moved. And uh, so a child called out, inspired by God, let Ambrose be our bishop, and by acclaim, uh, of the people of, of uh, Milano, uh, Omidio Lenses, <laughs> he was chosen and recommended, and he was accepted by the church. Yet, yes, he would be the man uh, whom God wants to be the bishop of that see. And uh, he was very reluctant, um, especially, I mean, considering that he's just a catechumen, uh, a humble catechumen, no doubt felt himself very unworthy. Um, so he was just the ideal person for the, for the task. But he was uh, ordained through the minor orders, through the major orders, step by step, day by day by day, one day at a time, until he was finally consecrated a bishop. Uh, the church did not omit anything in his case, did not jump from one to another uh, or jump over any of the orders, but gave him each of the orders in turn. And this is the mind of the church that we see expressed over and over again throughout our history. <laughs> so, uh, now it is true. I mean, if someone, let's say someone were not, was not ordained 
an exorcist, or let's say somebody was not ordained, <clears throat> a, uh, a subdeacon, which the Novus Ordo did away with, <clears throat> or a deacon validly, when they were validly ordained a priest, they would have received all of the powers and all of the, 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 the uh, prerogatives of the lower orders. But that's not the same, that's not the case with somebody uh, who has never validly ordained a priest and then being consecrated a bishop. The people might be mistaken, he might be mistaken, thinking that he was validly ordained. God knows why he wouldn't have been validly ordained. But consecrating him a bishop would not thereby make him a priest. According to the church's um, theology, according to understanding sacramental theology, and according to the practice of the church, it wouldn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All right. Um, and by the way, yeah. uh, whoever wrote that might, might find an author here or there who says, well, it probably is this way, it probably is that way, it probably would, yeah. and that's, that in the practical order is worth nothing. It's an opinion. Yeah. And uh, in fact, the church has never ratified that opinion. Yeah. So in practice, you couldn't use that. You could not risk your soul on that happening just because somebody says, well, we think it probably would be okay. Yeah. That doesn't count when it comes <laughs> yeah. to the sacraments. Yeah. All right. Um, Father, we had uh, another question from a, a viewer. He asked... Uh, well, I said, Father, that it seems that Catholics are rightly focused on the abortion issue in our country, but do they have a uh, do they have any kind of responsibility to be equally concerned about our foreign policy? Should we consider that um, on equal footing? With well, the abortion equally issue? equally concerned. Um, <clears throat> I guess the word equally. We they had have a, Catholics have an obligation to be concerned about whatever affects morality, whatever affects the commandments, the service to God, and uh, right and wrong, good and evil, right? So insofar as uh, foreign policy uh, does concern all of those things, and if actually the, the, the foreign policy of the United States really has life and death uh, consequences for peoples throughout the world. Well, yes, we should be concerned about that. Uh, it's the same motivation that would uh, prompt us to resist abortion in any way we could uh, at all times. That same motivation should say, well, I, I, you know, we have to protect innocent life. Uh, we certainly cannot condone murder. We have to do everything we, we can to prevent it, this terrible sin of uh, murder, whether it involve a child in the womb or, you know, a somebody in a foreign country because of our foreign policy, um, which is, uh, shall we say, not according to, you know, the commandments. Um, equally, I'm not so sure, because equally with abortion, we have the domestic, uh, not foreign policy, but domestic policy in our own house. And we have to be, if we're going to be concerned about sin anywhere, we should be concerned about sin in our own house. You might say, even as a father or a mother would be concerned about sin within the own, their family, under their roof, right? So they might, they'd have a special obligation to oppose that sin. And you have another reason too, because of the innocence of the innocent, the child, who is not guilty of any actual sin, child has original sin, and if the child died with original sin, it would not see God in heaven. So we have to be concerned about that with regard to children too, uh, children in the womb and abortion. Okay. So I would say we might have uh, in, in, in certain sense and in, in those senses, a, a greater obligation to oppose the evil of abortion in our own house. Um, than to oppose sins elsewhere. We have an obligation to oppose sin everywhere. We have an obligation to oppose the crimes committed by our, our loved ones, by our rulers. We have an obligation to oppose those things. But we have a greater obligation to oppose 
them insofar as we are more respons personally responsible for them. <clears throat> and as far as we have the ability to stand up and to oppose them and the power to stop them. And um, that's, that's why I take issue with the word equally. I think we have a greater obligation <coughs> to uh, oppose abortion in our own country. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, well, Father, those were all the, uh, the viewer questions I had, but uh, we did... Um, I know some of our some of our viewers are very interested to hear what you thought of uh, of Francis's latest comments um, about the talking about the diversity of religions. Again, he um, mentioned something just the other day about uh, this diversity of religions as a gift from God, and um, apparently the Vatican came out with a a different translation trying to correct uh, apparently what what yeah. Francis had said. But um, then I guess just oh. today he kind of reiterated this point again, saying yeah. something. The fact that that uh, you know this this diversity of religions they're all passed to God and they're all uh, this diversity is actually a gift a gift of God. So what did you what did you think well, of hearing that? Well, this is just Francis saying what he said many times before. Um, he told the Imam right in Abu Dhabi that God wills all the diversity of religions. Um, on the surface of it, without spinning it, that is heretical, and they have to try to then interpret it in such a way that it's not, uh, to give it a spin, as it were, okay? Parse the words so that it comes out that it doesn't equal heresy. And they tried, but Francis has made these statements many times. It's impossible uh, to take all of the statements he's made on the subject and, and simply uh, explain them all away. <clears throat> he was speaking to a mixed group of young people in Singapore recently, and... Um, this is what sparked the current outrage. Uh, he was telling them, well, you shouldn't be arguing about whose God is greater because there's really only one God, you know. We all believe in the same God. And he, he said that actually all religions, and he said tutti, he said, all religions lead to God. And he's saying there's only one God. So all religions lead to God. Okay. <clears throat> now, again, on the surface of it, that is heretical. You go in and you tweak it, you twist it, say, well, you didn't mean it that way, and you start parsing the words to try to avoid saying this equals heresy, okay? Um, but it did. It was heretical. It was a heretical statement on its very face. Um, all they could do is come out and say, well, he didn't mean it that way. Okay, so the Vatican did what the Vatican does and has done. Uh, when, when Francis makes statements to Scalfari years ago, you know, um, the Vatican comes out and says, well, this is what he really meant. Or, he didn't really say that, Scalfari got it wrong, right? They, they find, find some way to get around it. <clears throat> uh, when he said in Abu Dhabi, God wills the diversity of all religions, and they found again, say, well, God tolerates it, that's his resigned will, not his... Uh, designed will, you know, however they wanted to express it back then, um, to try to somehow bring it back within the realm of orthodox interpretation. Um, they had to, again, reinterpret these words of Francis, that all religions lead to God. Francis was addressing Sikhs, he was addressing Muslims, he was addressing Christians of various stripes, uh, he was uh, ad addressing a, a number of other Hindus and so on. And his message to them was, well, you all worship the same God. And all of our religions all lead to the same God. Um, so this is about as explicit and implicit denial of Christ and the, the essential uh, need for our Lord Jesus Christ as you can get. Uh, without saying that, well, yes, follow Christ, he will lead you to God. Follow Buddha, he will lead you to God. Follow Muhammad, he will lead you to God, you know. Uh, so there was a hue and cry, as there is uh, from time to time with Francis. The Vatican then comes out with a new spin. They reinterpret what he said, and they give you the interpretation of what he said, okay? And what they said was what all religions... Uh, uh, how, did, how, did, how did they put it? I remember. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, they, they, they changed the word 
to something else, yeah. uh, bring you to God or something like that. <clears throat> and, um, but essentially, I mean, the meaning was the same, <laughs> but it, it softened it a bit, okay? And lo and behold, no sooner had they come out and given this uh, sanitized version of what Francis said, uh, then Francis comes out and says it again, right? <laughs> that all religions, the diversity of religions is a gift from God, okay? Um, heresy, right? So <clears throat> this is even worse than um, <clears throat> God wills the diversity of religions because um, they could argue, well, God willed it, meaning he allowed it, okay? And so not as something objectively good, but God is willing to put up with it and tolerate it. But now he says that they're gifts from God. And a gift is a good thing, right? He's the father of gifts. All good gifts come from the father of lights in heaven, right? So if God gives a gift, it's something good, it's something beautiful, it's something, um, something salutary for you. And so it's going to be a lot harder for them to spin this. I mean, maybe they'll just say, well, he just lapsed into German when he used the word gift. And in, in gift... In German, gift means poison. So that's what Francis really meant. It'll be interesting to see how they spin this one. But he says, in fact, that all these diversity of religions, a gift from God. <clears throat> a, and um, so they're all good. They're all good things. Um, the fact that some acknowledge Jesus Christ and that others deny him, that others say, if you say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, we're going to cut your head off. <clears throat> that contradiction, it doesn't stop Francis from saying, but all of these religions, nonetheless, come from God. They're all gifts from God. The religion that Jesus Christ established, the Catholic religion, <clears throat> gift from God, the Mohammedan religion that says if you believe that Christ Jesus is the Son of God, that they're supposed to cut your head off, that comes from God too. The same God gives us both those religions. And uh, other religions that might consider uh, Jesus to be you know, like an avatar or a, uh, uh, a bodhisattva or some other manifestation of the divine, um, that's okay. You know, it all comes from the same God. And so what this really is, is an attack on who God is. It's an, actually an attack on the very understanding of who God is and whom God has revealed himself to be. So we think, okay, well, if uh, Francis is saying, and, and like other heretics, <clears throat> that you don't have to believe in Jesus Christ uh, to be saved, um, you don't even have to believe in God to be saved, <clears throat> as he's indicated. I think he's come out and said it, really. An atheist can be saved just by being charitable, whatever that means. Um, then you, you are actually uh, a blaspheming God himself in attacking the very concept of who God is. Now, if I were to ask you who God is, what would you say? Who is God? Um, God is uh, the creator of heaven and earth and of all things. Okay, that's true. The Catechism says God is the... Supreme, Supreme being, being yeah. right? We made heaven and earth, created heaven and earth. But we use the expression supreme being um, because God himself has identified himself as the supreme being. I am who am, Yahweh, okay? Um, that's the name he gave to Moses, right? I am who am, I exist. I am the supreme being. All that exists derives its being from me. I will it into existence because I am. Am okay. Now, this God is the foundation of all truth, and all that is true uh, must arise from Him, must take its origins from Him, because He is the truth. Jesus Christ said, I am the way and the truth and the life. <clears throat> okay, so if we now uh, uh, posit contradiction in God and say, Oh, God is just too great to have just one religion. No, no, it's like various facets of a diamond where you have all these different faces of God expressing himself in different ways. That's all blasphemy because we, we know that God is simplicity itself in his divine being, his supreme being. 
And he is the absolute truth and the foundation of all that, that is true. And there is no error found in him. We say he's the God who can neither deceive nor be deceived. What kind of deceiver God is this who spins off a multiplicity of different religions all contradicting themselves and saying, okay, you can believe whatever you want, find a religion that you like, and lo and behold, they're all going to wind up back here with me. They're all going to lead you to me. Right? Like as though the world is some gigantic labyrinth, but no matter what path you choose, you're going to all wind up in the same place. You're going to wind up in heaven. <clears throat> That's blasphemy. That is an insult to God himself. St. Thomas Aquinas said, that is the worst form of intellectual sin. Uh, it is an attack on the very divine being. <laughs> uh, it's it's a lot, telling a lie about God. And a lie about God <clears throat> either attributes to him something that is bad, attributes some evil to him, saying something is that there is some evil in God, or it denies in him something that is good. Either way, it's a lie from God. And this is not only heresy, but it is blasphemy. Again, Francis has spoken so consistently, blasphemously and heretically, that all you're getting now is, with the latest example, a kind of flare-up of outrage, and then it all dies down and just goes back to waiting for the next outrage. I mean, what happened to the outrage when he blesses the Pachamama idol in the garden of, of uh, the Vatican Gardens? It, it just kind of blew over, right? Um, when, when he set up the idols in uh, the Carmelite church there, along the Via della Conciliazione, right? Um, and that's where um, it, was, it was taken, remember that? And uh, thrown in the Tiber River, right? Of course, you know, there was outrage about all of that. They, they were, the other side was outraged that they were thrown in the Tiber. People felt vindicated by that. The Catholics felt vindicated by it, you might say. But it all kind of blew over. But the worst of it is, uh, not only did Francis do those things, but he had actually had this idol set up at the podium, in front of the podium, during the entire Amazonian synod. So that those who were meeting in that assembly and listening to the speakers during the synod of the Amazon were facing this, this, this podium with the speaker, and right in front of it was this, this pagan idol. And uh, even worse than that was that there was a shrine set up on the floor of St. Peter's Basilica, in honor of Pachamama, the, this pagan goddess, um, this false god. And the shrine was, had various different representatives, representations of Pachamama, including snakes that were on the floor, all radiating inward toward the central idol. Yeah, snakes, serpents, right? Another symbol of Pachamama. <laughs> the earth goddess, right? right in the floor of the St. Peter Basilica. People are upset, sure, but they got over it. They always do. And it goes on, and they're just waiting for the next one. Francis goes to Canada, takes part in the pagan ceremony, goes through the motions with the pagan shaman, summons the spirits from the four winds. Francis is going through the whole thing with them. You know, People are uh, horrified scandalized, disgusted by it, yes, and then they move on. And every time Francis comes out with something like this, they're, uh, they're horrified anew, they're disgusted anew, <laughs> right? They're scandalized anew by the, by the thing. And then it just kind of goes away because they learn to accept it. Every time this happens, they get used to it. They're getting more and more accustomed to it. That this is what popes do. That you can be a pope and you can, you can do this. You can do these horrible, blasphemous, heretical, sacrilegious things. And it doesn't have any, any effect whatsoever on you being the pope or not. It's irrelevant almost. 
And uh, it's, they're destroying the very concept of the papacy. And that's what Francis is doing. Uh, the conservatives who still have the faith and realize this is wrong, they're being, as it were, um, should I say, accustomed, they're becoming more and more accustomed to this thing, thing. And that is the death of faith. That is the death of faith. They're being slowly turned into modernists where they learn to accept these things. If not, uh, not accepting them, at least tolerating them, maybe even to the point where they kind of justify them, you know? The point is they don't condemn them for what they are, the horror for what they are in the eyes of God. That, no, their sense of, their senses, could, their senses fide, their sense of the faith is being eroded away by all these things. Um, and that's, that's why we have this program, among other things. We're trying to prevent that. We're trying to encourage them and rally them to say, no, you cannot make peace with these things. You cannot tolerate these things. These things are intolerable. They would be intolerable in your son or your daughter. They'd be intolerable in your mother or your father. They'd be intolerable in your friends. They'd be intolerable in your parish priest. They are intolerable in the man you're calling Pope. They're intolerable. They are diametrically opposed to the faith. Now people are beginning to, you know, um, there are some who are actually willing to venture forth, as it were, from the cave and, and take a good look at these things. Uh, Bishop Strickland, for example, erstwhile Bishop of Tyler, Texas, who was basically uh, fired by Francis from that task because he said too many Catholic things. Um, but Bishop Strickland has come out and said, look, to say this is heresy. This is heresy. Um, Archbishop Vigano, you know who that is, Archbishop Vigano. He was the Novus Ordo Bishop for many, many, many years, right? Now he repents of that, okay? But he has come out and said, this is apostasy. And that's, more, that's actually more accurate than saying it's merely heresy. It actually is apostasy. But it is a denial of the very Catholic understanding of who God is. And Francis has plainly stated this time after time after time after time after time. And um, I hope that with many, many of these people, he's running out of excuses. I hope they're running out of excuses for him. And they're willing to face the fact that this man is not a Catholic. He doesn't have the Catholic faith. And there are very serious consequences to that. I mean, I pray for his conversion. I don't want him to go to hell. And I don't want him to take hundreds, thousands, millions of people with him. So I do pray for his conversion. But when you have to pray for someone's conversion, it's not because they have the faith. It's because they don't. And uh, I would recommend that uh, the, those out there, the Catholics who still are Catholic and so are, and so are, to the extent that they still believe the Catholic faith, and therefore they realize that this man does not have the faith, I would ask them to join me in praying for his conversion, but praying also for the conversion of all those who are following him into the abyss, because that's where he's leading them. Okay. So, um, anyway, Tom, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, uh, what else have you got here? I'm sure there are other... That, that was about it, Father. We did, um, we did maybe just uh, want to acknowledge that um, you uh, did receive a uh, rather interesting letter from a uh, fellow traditional Catholic priest. Um, oh, yes. I don't know if you wanted to comment on that tonight. Perhaps we could lead Thanks with that. Thanks for mentioning that. I've been meaning to mention that for some time. Yeah. In fact, I've been meaning to get back to him. Uh, and I appreciate very much uh, the information he sent me. Uh, Father Leandro Neves de Oliveira wrote me. He was with the Society of St. Pius X for a while. <coughs> is no longer with them because he saw the issues with Francis. And he just could not it just uncritically accept the line that, he, that Francis must be the Pope. He's the whole Pope and nothing but the Pope. Uh, Father... Uh, uh, Leandro Neves de Oliveira realized that it's there's a serious question, to say the least, at the least. And um, 
I think he's actually gone over to the Sede Vacante side and saying that um, now he can speak for himself, but that's the impression I get from what he wrote me. And I would write what he wrote me, but I would want uh, permission to read his letter. But the, the interesting thing is he was responding to the question of the one-handed ordination. Remember that? Um, because uh, Pope Pius XII, in his document, um, Sacramento Ordinance in 1947, said that the hands of the bishop, uh, the imposition of the hands, plural, is necessary for the ordination of a priest. Now, uh, the priest sent me, this good priest sent me the uh, information from a, a, the work of a canonist named Rigatello. And uh, in fact, he sent me um, visuals of this work. I'm not entirely unfamiliar with it because uh, Father Chicada appealed to it at one point also. Uh, this is the, uh, was it the Latin? I forget whether it was the Latin or the English. But uh, Father, um, I know with the Spanish names, one has to uh, take the, uh, the, the last name, I think, uh, Olivera. Uh, is probably the name of his mother. I'm not entirely conversant, unfortunately. I wish I were. But Father Leandro Neves de Oliveira, I want to get his name correctly. Respect requires that. Send me pictures uh, from Casos Canonico Morales in Spanish by Eduardus Arigatello, a Jesuit. And it means uh, canonical cases, moral theology, okay? moral case, uh, cases where a, a question is posed about something happening and then uh, the morality of it is discussed, okay? <clears throat> and in uh, Tomo Secundo, in the second volume of his work on uh, what, what was Sacramentos, concerning the sacraments, the question is raised about a one-handed ordination of a priest. And the, uh, the work which is almost illegible to me, unfortunately, uh, when, I, when I copy it. I can barely make it out on the screen. But um, it's, it says that when Pope Pius XII uh, said that the hands, plural, were necessary for the valid ordination of a priest, he did not mean to say that one hand would be invalid. And then there are three paragraphs or so in which Rigatello talks about that and gives essentially his, his view, his statement that using the one hand would not be an invalid ordination of the priesthood, but it would be, suffice to be valid, validly ordained priest. And um, is this helpful? Yes. Is it, is it significant? Yes, it is. And I appreciate uh, Father sending me this information. Is it compelling? Well, that's the problem, because I just don't see from what he sent me. Maybe it's on the screen, but I just don't. I can't make it out. I don't see where Rigatello actually um, gives a reference of an actual case judged by the Holy See from 1947 until, let's say, 1960. Uh, this was dated, I think, 1959, but. Um, what, what we're really looking for is an actual case decided by the Holy See authoritatively addressing this very question and saying, yes, this is all right. Rigatello says, yeah, the Holy See did that, but he, I don't see anywhere that he gives an actual reference that one could go and do his due diligence and do research and actually go and see it, that yes, this is an actual case that was decided by the Holy Office or the Holy See on this particular date, and uh, it's, a, it's a specific answer to a specific question of a specific case. And um, I would love so much to resolve this matter once and for all and, and, and get the, the right answer. I just want the true answer to it. If the answer were, for in fact, that yes, the Holy See did answer this question, and it answered the question in the affirmative, that it would be a valid ordination, I would be greatly, well, I would be very grateful and greatly relieved 
to find out that the church had given an authoritative answer to that. But um, that will take more than a regatello just saying, well, this is the way it is. The Holy See made that decision already many times, so um, you know, just accept it for what it is. I would like as a true canonist or a true moral theologian uh, that he would actually cite the cases and give the, um, the, the book, chapter, and verse necessary for, let's say, other theologians to go and verify what he's saying. So I, I would ask, I guess, uh, this dear priest now to, to follow up, if he could, with uh, more information. Um, and um, if he, he's aware of particular cases that have been judged by the Holy See, I would, I would say from 1947, when the decree was issued by Pius XII, until 1960, uh, things began to change in earnest under, under John the Twenty Third. I would be immensely grateful to him for providing whatever information he has, or any other priest for that matter, or layman, if they have uh, specific uh, documents they can cite, specific cases they can cite that can be verified. Um, well, that would be much appreciated. Okay. So, okay. I'll pray for that. <laughs> Sounds good. Anything else you want to mention tonight, Father? Well, you know, we are in this uh, month of September right now. Beautiful feast days of Our Lady. Too. We have the feast of Our Blessed Lady's Nativity on September 8th, which was a Sunday this year. So we celebrated the feast day on a Sunday. The Sunday was commemorated. A few days later, we had the feast of the naming of Our Blessed Lady. And um, that was a, a great feast day. We had a high mass sung here by the students. And then the next Sunday, uh, we had the feast of Our Lady of Sorrows, last Sunday, the seven sorrows of Our Lady. <clears throat> so two consecutive Sundays, we had feast days of Our Blessed Mother. And uh, in the middle, we had a third feast day of Our Lady there. So it's, it's a glorious time, you know, for those <clears throat> devoted to Our Lady. And uh, before the month is over, just very soon, we're going to have the Feast of Our Lady of Ransom. And of course, that's a great feast day commemorating the historical establishment of a religious order. Men would enter that religious order, make their vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, but also they would, they would vow to go in exchange for Catholic prisoners who had been captured in the raids by the Muslims, Muslim corsairs, raiding the coasts of Catholic countries and burning the villages to ground, abusing the women, murdering the children or kidnapping them and fathers, able-bodied men, and taking them back to auction them off as slaves on the coast of Africa. Again, Islam is the greatest slaver, slaving, uh, enslaver in the history of the world. And it continues today. It's part of the religion, enslavement. Um, for those who will not be the slaves of Allah, they have not only the right, but the duty to enslave them. <clears throat> In any case, <clears throat> um, so when we celebrate the Feast of Our Lady of Ransom, <clears throat> we are actually celebrating in, in, a, in a way uh, the fact that Our Lady has brought the ransom from heaven for all of us from the slavery of sin and condemnation to death. Um, we're all slaves to death. We're slaves to evil now. We're slaves to Satan. That's how Satan, Satan sees it. He, he claims us. He says he has a right to us because we're in sin. <clears throat> and when we're in sin, we, as far as he's concerned, consider him our Lord. Um, only when we can escape sin can we escape him. And Our Lady has brought that price of ransom from heaven for us. <clears throat> so it has a very large mystical meaning, the Feast of Our Lady of Ransom. And then, of course, you know, we have other feast days that follow that. We have uh, you know, Feast Day of St. Jerome on September 30th, well, St. St. Michael the Archangel and his fellow angels on the 29th. And then St. Jerome on the 30th, we have the Feast Day of St. Teresa of Lisieux, St. Francis. We have the Feast Day of the... Holy Rosary of Our Lady and the great victory of Lepanto. On October 7th, that's when we're going to celebrate the ordination of 
Father Michael Butler here, one of our own sons of uh, Immaculate Conception Church here, ordained a priest now. We're going to celebrate that with a solemn mass at five o'clock. If you can be here on October 7th in Norwood, in the church, Immaculate Conception, you will be there for the solemn mass offered by Father Butler. And then if you can, <coughs> There's a dinner, reservations are necessary, but there's a celebration dinner taking place after that, very near the church. Grand event. If you can't be there, you will still be able to tune in and watch on the live stream the solemn mass that Father Butler will be offering, 5 o'clock on October 7th, the Feast of the Most Holy Rosary. And then just a, four days later, the Feast of the Maternity of Our Blessed Lady, Our Lady's Motherhood, which is actually the foundation of all the other privileges. All the other privileges that she received all come down to this, that her vocation was to be the mother of God made man and become the savior. Um, so whether you're thinking of the Immaculate Conception, uh, her perpetual sinlessness, her perpetual virginity, uh, her assumption to heaven, all of those other privileges are traceable back to the fact that her vocation was to be the mother of the Savior, God's Son here on earth. And they celebrate that on October 11th. That is the name day for the daughters of Mary, mother of our Savior. That's their patronal feast day. So you see, magnificent feast days all during this month, uh, September going into October. So, uh, you know, I was very happy to see that first question about living out that um, love and gratitude for Mary day by day through the consecration. So uh, anyway, I guess that brings us full circle, doesn't it? All right. As often it does. Right? Yeah. Well, Father, thanks for everything tonight. Appreciate it. God bless you. Well, thank you, Tom. God bless you, too. Yeah. Thanks to all of our viewers for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.